Yeah, welcome everyone. My name is Kai Eckert. I'm one of the tutorial chairs of this year's uh, Dublin Core conference, again, a virtual conference. Um, and it's a pleasure to welcome you here to the first tutorial of this conference. We have two uh, in some. The other one will be on next Friday, if I'm not mistaken. No, this Friday, this Friday. And today um, we want to learn about Omega S. Um, we have here the team from Omega S. We have Robin Fay in person, supported by Ken Albers. Robin Fay is uh, the Omega end user support and training specialist. Uh, Ken works uh, or is in the, the Omega.net and Omega services manager and also a web developer working at uh, or for Omega S. And we will also see Sharon Leon, who is the director of Omega um, and also associate professor of history and digital humanities at Michigan State University. And as I heard, she will be part of the presentation, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but is not with us here uh, in person today. So without further ado, and still attendees joining. Um, have fun, enjoy the tutorial. The stage is all yours, Robin. Well, um, welcome everyone. Thank you for um, contacting us about doing a tutorial about Amaka S. I am Robin Fay. I'm the Amaka Outreach and Training Specialist. I do a lot of training <laughs> and answer questions and various things. Uh, Ken is here. He is, well, he wears so many hats, but Amecha.net. And I, I will touch on those just a little bit as we're kind of talking about like what works, what kind of services we offer. Uh, Sharon will talk more about that, but I'll kind of talk a little bit about it as we go too. So I'm really going to be focusing on what Amecha asks um, can do for you in terms of working with metadata and in terms of um, our vision for how we fit into sort of the met metadata landscape. And I will just say right now that I come from the library and archives world. Uh, I was a metadata person for many years and did lots of description. And that's actually how I got involved in Emeka. Um, I was probably like many of you and looking for a solution for a institutional repository, a digital archive, we kind of have this hybrid project going on. Um, and I was looking for something that would work for that particular um, solution. And I found a map, <laughs> as many of you do as well. Um, if you'll let me know if you can see my screen, okay, just. Um, give me a yes and let me know if you, if you can see everything. So I'm going to um, mostly we're going to first hear from Sharon and then I'll take over and we'll talk through some of the aspects of Emeka. We're really going to focus on the metadata part of it. So uh, I'll talk a little bit about the design part of it, but we're really not going to you know talk too much about you know the design and theming and stuff like that. We'll just touch on that part of it because Data. We're going to talk about quick, data. Quick interruption. Uh, you, yes. you have to reshare your screen. Oh, uh, I you... do have to reshare my screen. Okay. Yeah, you got it taken away for the nice video introduction. Oh, <laughs> I'm so you. sorry. <laughs> that's that's okay. Okay, so now okay. you can now see my back. screen. <laughs> yes. Okay, fantastic. Okay, so so there's my contact information too. I'll share that again at the end. So a lot of the uh, things I'll be talking about. I do have a, a closing slide that has a list of resources. And so you'll have that information to as sort of shortcuts uh, to get to some of this. Uh, we do offer a variety of services, including training, and you can contact me right there, either training at emeka.org or robin at emeka.org, either one works. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about training as we go as well. So, Agenda, we're gonna start with Sharon's director's message and she's going to give us a great history of Amecha and really talk about the different pieces that'll be inter of interest to you. And then I'm gonna dive in and I'm gonna show you some things 
uh, we're going to do some screenshot kind of things, but then I'm going to do a demo and then we're going to give you a chance to play in our sandbox. Hopefully it'll work. So we'll see how that goes. And then we'll finally wrap up with any questions and answers. I'll talk some more about the resources. It's your opportunity to ask anything you want to ask. I will, um, and Ken's gonna help me watch the chat. So if you have questions as we go along, feel free to drop them in the chat. I may wait till the end to address those, or I may go ahead and just you know talk about them then. I don't mind being interrupted with questions um, by any means. So on that note, Here's Sharon Leon. And we can't hear her. You probably have to reshare with sound enabled. Uh -huh. Okay. Um, let's see. Okay, so you can't hear Sharon. Is that correct? Yeah, but when you just... Uh, stop the sharing and start mm -hmm. it again. And there should be a check mark for sound sharing. Okay. It's, I think it's disabled by default. Oh, okay. Uh, let's see, maybe it's under advanced. Okay, I do see, okay, I'm gonna try, there's video. So, okay, we're gonna try. I have, I have two settings, yeah. share, share sound and optimize for video clip, so. Depends okay, on Zoom. Let's see. <laughs> yeah, it probably does depend on Zoom. Okay, so it's not video then. Okay. Oh, you know what? I did just see it. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I just expected it to capture the sound automatically. All right, one more time, and I think we will have this. Okay really several different uh, versions of Omer, and most of you. Okay, let me start yeah. again. And that worked. Fantastic. Learn something new. <laughs> Hi, my name is Sharon Leon, and I'm the director of the OMEC project, and I'm really pleased to be with you here today um, to talk a little bit about the backstory of Omeka and how Omeka S came to be. Um, if you'll forgive me for a second, I'm going to Hi, my name is Sharon Leon, and I'm the director of the OMEC project, and I'm really pleased to be with you here today um, to talk a little bit about the backstory of OMECA and how OMECA S came to be. Um, if you'll forgive me for a second, I'm going to uh, share my screen. Yeah. All right. So many of you will know that there are really several different uh, versions of OMECA, and most of you will be familiar to some degree with the original version of Omeka, Omeka Classic. But most of what we're going to talk about today is Omeka S. So this is the, this is the current Omeka site where you can see the, uh, the two core platforms. Both of them are now available in the 3.0 version. Um, and Omeka Classic has been around and out in the world since 2008, and Omeka S sort of really came uh, came into being in around 2015. I have been with the project since the beginning, since we um, just had the glimmer of a hope of a web publishing platform that would help users who were not technical experts uh, share their collections and their materials with the world. While the project started at the Roy Rosenzweig Center for History and New Media, it's been fully independent since 2016, and it is stewarded under the auspices of Digital Scholar, which is a not-for-profit corporation that provides financial backing and sustainability and systems for Omeka, but also Zotero, Tropy, and other open source uh, scholarly communications and digital humanity software that you might be familiar with. So, Many of you will remember the original version of Omeka, Omeka Classic, as it launched in 2008, was already dedicated to uh, the benefits of structured and systematized metadata. Many of our users at that point in the uh, late aughts hadn't quite grasped the real importance of metadata schema and the ways that um, dedication to a schema like Dublin Core could 
uh, enhance interoperability and um, really the construction possibilities for their web work. But we were dedicated to hopefully presetting the um, instincts of the field. Folks who were not used to working with digitized collections and structured data um, to sort of introduce them to a metadata schema that was not too burdensome, but that could really um, allow them to publish materials that would be interoperable um, across institutions and things like that. And in the years since, there have been hundreds of thousands of dedicated uh, Omeka Classic users. And so for many, their first introduction to Dublin Core came through Omeka Classic. Um, Omega Classic is still available and has just been uh, treated to an administrative interface refresh, which many of you will welcome since the, the interface hadn't be, been refreshed since 2012. Um, it continues to be um, dedicated to uh, responsive design and accessibility while also striving for creating an experience that is simple enough for non-technical users to work with. Omega Classic is also available to the world who uh, doesn't have the capacity to uh, host their own open source software through our hosting platform, which is Omeka.net. And so while we might think about Omeka.net as a multi-site instance of Omeka Classic, um, it is not really the multi-site instance that will be uh, available to users of Omeka S, where one can build lots of uh, lots of sites out, out of one Omeka installation. Omeka.net is actually running many, many separate uh, Omeka classic installations so that uh, users material is um, available to them and only to them and, 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 and not to other users. And at this point, we have roughly 80,000 users and about 60,000 sites on Omeka.net, which has been up and running in the world since 2010. In 2013, with funding from the Mellon Foundation, we turned to creating Omeka S, which is what Robin Fay is gonna spend most of the rest of today talking to you about and introducing you to the inner workings of the software. Um, once we sort of got to a mature version of Omeka Classic, we realized, uh, that the world of the web and digital collections had changed fairly significantly. Uh, and we were interested in building a web publishing platform that um, allowed medium to large users to install the software once and then publish many sites out of a repository of collections. Equally, we wanted it to be fully embedded in the linked data world, the semantic web. Um, and we really wanted it to connect seamlessly with the rest of the scholarly communications ecosystem. And so we worked very hard to develop the first version uh, of Omeka S, which as I mentioned, came into the world in 2015 and then, and then in 1.0 in 2016. Um, we built it as much um, smart software design for particularly for open source software is built these days. We built the API first um, and all of the construction of the core software and its extensions in modules. All of that works through the software's own API. Uh, the native data format for Omeka S is JSON, uh, JSON LD. And so it is all linked data from the beginning. So our idea here as we launched Omeka S consisted of these elements. We wanted people to be able to install it once and create many sites. We wanted them to be able to easily publish linked data, which we know is not, is not particularly easy for novice users. So with the, with the uh, comfort of a graphical user interface, just about anyone can really publish well-formed linked data. Um, we wanted the material to be interoperable with lots of the important aggregator sites. We've noted here DPLA, but because of uh, the base loading of vocabularies of Dublin Core, Bibo, and FOF, which come with the core installation of the software, uh, an installation of Omeka S is fairly ready to go from the beginning. 
to produce materials that can easily be shared with the Digital Public Library of America or with Europeana based on their metadata models. And of course, Dublin Core is at the heart of this. Just like with Omeka Classic, we were very interested in inviting, in inviting a larger world of developers and designers to easily extend the software. And you'll see that we have lots and lots of modules that have been contributed, contributed by non-Omeka team developers. And again, building out the rich API at the heart of this software is what makes that possible. And hopefully, um, we'll see more designers begin to contribute themes for others to use. As a very successful open source pro project, we've seen a lot of development contribution work via pull requests to the core software and submission of modules to uh, the repositories. This is true for Omeka Classic as well. Lots of plugins submitted to the repositories. For some reason, we see much less in the way of generalizing and sharing themes. And we're always eager to have designers share themes so that we can ease the transition uh, into building accessible responsive sites that are uh, unique and attractive for, for all of our users especially those who don't have a ton of design experience. We want to start with a good base. So if you're out there designing themes, we'd love to have you th share them with us. So we're going to talk, and as I said, I'm sure that Robin is going to show you um, lots of these in detail today, but I think of the modules that are available for Omeka S, there are sort of classes of them that are available now and supported by the Omeka team that will be really important to users who are here at this Dublin Core conference. Um, and that's because you're, in, you're interested in best practices for well-formed descriptive data. Uh, and so we have a number of things that are important to data creation in Omeka Classic, um, excuse me, in Omeka S. Um, one of them is this, a very, very robust value suggest module, which allows you to draw on um, a whole world of controlled vocabularies and authority files that are served as linked data. So not only the US Library of Congress endpoints or the Getty Research Institute endpoints, but really um, a global array of, of um, endpoints that you can select to um, implement with your resource templates. We also know, of course, that not everyone um, has materials that match nicely with those existing authority files. And for that reason, we have a really robust custom vocabulary module that allows you to create custom vocabularies uh, as plain text, as uh, vocabularies that draw on existing Omeka S items, and as uh, vocabularies that use URIs in the world that might not be, um, that may not be being served from a Sparkle endpoint in such a way that you could add them to the value suggest module. Um, so that's really important for integrating um, the kinds of tweaks that you may want to make to the standardized vocabularies you want to use. Um, the third one there is uh, the numeric data types module. And Omeka comes with, um, a set of, of available data types in the core that allows you to select existing Omeka items as, as, as inputs, um, Omeka sets as inputs, uh, media, URIs, those sorts of things. But the numeric data types module um, extends that to make available a whole host of uh, ISO standard uh, numbers and dates. So. Also, we know that it's really important for people who are, are working with large scale data creation and cataloging to have easy ways to get material in and out of um, Omeka S. And so there is a very robust, uh, actually say, dare I say, quite complicated uh, CSV importer. Uh, if you were already working with Omeka Classic and you wanted to move into Omeka S, there's an Omeka 2 importer so that you can move your materials from an Omeka Classic site. Uh, and for those of you out there building large Zotero libraries of references as I am, there's also a Zotero importer. We also know that many of you work in situations where there's an institutional repository where you want the, the, um, 
preservation grade materials of your digitized collections to reside in that repository, but you still want to be able to mobilize them in a web publishing situation. And so for that, we have connectors for Fedora and DSpace. We hope that there will be more connectors coming um, in the relatively near term. And so um, coming soon in the modules that we're in the midst of developing, we have um, almost ready to release a, a really deep core data cleaning module so that you can do some data normalization directly in Omeka S. Um, we have the beginnings of what will be, um, I think, a quite sophisticated data visualization module. We have, we have base visualizations at the moment, bar charts, histograms, those sorts of things, pie charts. Um, but we're hoping to uh, extend and expand that module once we get the initial uh, 1.0 release. Um, we are working on a, a module to integrate persistent identifier services. So if you're using an ARC ID or something like that, um, you'd be able to connect your, connect your uh, subscription to uh, your persistent identifier service and in the process of creating Omeka S items, mint identifiers for them or input their existing identifiers. And then finally, we're, we're working at work on an aggregator for Omeka S installations. So if you wanted to bring together materials from many Omeka S installations, that would be possible too. In this sort of little bit longer term, we're looking at uh, building um, archive space connectors, collection space connector. And the one that is not on here that I failed to put on the list is a dataverse connector. So it would be possible to um, to access data sets in, in a data first installation. So some things that you might have to look forward to in your work with Omeka S going forward. Uh, we are always here for you. We're now a team of eight here at the Omeka team. Um, and so the forums are always free and available to you to ask questions. We're happy to support uh, there. That's part of the service we provide. We build it into our days. Um, additionally, however, and I'm sure Robin will tell you more about this, we have now uh, the ability to offer for you and your teams, your institutions, uh, a wide range of training and workshops um, to help you get situated with either Omeka Classic or Omeka S. In addition to those training and workshops, we provide a number of, uh, of services that you might be interested in. We do custom development and design. Um, if you wanted to work with us on that front, we do provide annual contract support plans um, for folks who need more than the kind of form support access that you might want. And finally, we have a whole array of isolated hosting plans. So if you'd like us to be responsible for the installation, installation hosting and maintenance of, of your services, uh, we can do that. And so, um, we got lots to share with you today about Omeka S and the ways that it may me mesh with um, your aspirations as folks who work closely with Dublin Core. And I'm really excited um, to see what you learn in the workshop and, and what Robin can, can bring to you um, as an experienced trainer working with, with this platform. Um, so. Best wishes to you today. I wish I could be with you live and in person. Um, I unfortunately have to go teach my undergraduates. So good luck and thank you. All right, so can you see my screen and hear me? You'll just let me know. So as Sharon mentioned, um, Ameka is supported by a team. So we are an open source product project, um, but we are unlike a lot of the other open source projects out there, other than the ones that are under the digital scholar um, umbrella, in that we do have a team of highly experienced uh, professionals who are continuing to uh, work on a Mecca. So that is, that is something that from my experience working with open source software is really unique and really valuable. So Sharon mentioned some of these already, but I just want to kind of circle back on some of the things that she talked about. 
Uh, one of the nice things about a Mecca S, especially if you are a large organization or a consortia or a group in some way, even a, um, a group of departments within a particular umbrella at a university or college, you can install a Mecca once and then you can use it to manage many sites or have people work on many sites. So that streamlines the process of installation of a Mecca in that you only have to have that one installation and then underneath that one installation you can have as you know a bunch of a bunch of other sites and those can then be managed they can have different themes they can look different from each other but that central installation only has to happen once and that also means upgrades only happen have to happen once we do not um, upgrade all the time like some of these other open source projects out there um, we have a very um, organized upgrade process. And as Sharon mentioned, we just had an upgrade for classic, which was the first one in a little while. Um, so that, you know, that is something that we do work into our, um, our process. Of course, Emeka S has a variety of user roles, so you can really customize and tailor uh, what users can do. You can collect if you want to have um, community members or outside participants, you can actually um, set up accounts so that they can submit content, but they're not actually um, you know, involved in, in doing sort of the backend stuff. Um, as I mentioned, advantages to using a Mecca, there's us. <laughs> we, and we do continuously improve a Mecca, as Sharon mentioned, uh, people do um, request things or if they find something that you know they'd like it to work a little bit different, a tweak or something like that, there's a conversation that is happening between the community and the Mecca team regularly. Uh, we all are checking the forums and um, you know it kind of depends upon what time of the day as to who, who might answer or, or what their expertise is and to whom, who might um, answer, but we do uh, check our documentation regularly, we update documentation, and we monitor and respond to questions through the forum. Uh, sometimes people, which is fine, you, the forum's open, anyone can um, ask questions on the forum. Sometimes people ask questions about uh, those modules or plugins. If it's a Mecca Classic, it's a, a plugin. If it's a Mecca S, it's a module. But sometimes people ask about um, you know, ask about a module or plugin that is not something that we've created. And, you know, we, we may have a little information about it or know something about it, but sometimes we're just going to have to refer you back to um, the person who created it. And that's one of the, I think, one of the interesting things and fun things about being part of the open source community is seeing, as Sharon mentioned, how active our community is and seeing all the different things that people are creating uh, with Emeka. Uh, we do offer, as Sharon mentioned, the, a variety of services. So we offer the hosting, support plans, and the dedicated training, which is me. Um, we have those three products, as Sharon mentioned. And if you are not exactly sure, I know we're focused on a Mecca S today, but maybe you've been talking to others uh, in your college or university or in your community group and you're sort of like, well, we're not really sure which one might be best for us or maybe we really need something cloud-based or you're just having a little bit of a hard time kind of figuring out which one would be best for your project and your needs. The Emeka team, including me, is always willing to uh, meet with folks and we'll meet with you remotely using Google Meet or Zoom, and we will talk you through kind of your options and help you in terms of that decision. And Ken certainly is a great person if you have a Mecca.net questions, but um, a lot of times he will meet as part of those project meetings so that we can help answer those questions or help really help you get all the information you need to really evaluate which which project is going to be best for you. They're all actively supported. So it's not that one is supported more than the other. They are all actively supported. Emeka.net is just the cloud-based version of Emeka. 
Classic, and then of course Mecca Classics, ori original Mecca, and that's something you would install on your own server as a Mecca.s would be too. So, what do we do with a Mecca? Well, you know, it's really meant toward to curate and describe resources. So as Sharon was talking about, you know, you might have an institutional repository, you might have a DSpace or a Fedora repository, and you still want to have your things there, but you want to be able to, you know, create some really nice exhibits and, and pull them together and really highlight and feature those resources that you have uh, squirreled away in your Fedora and DSpace installation. And Emeka just does that wonderfully. So not only does it have the ability to store the items and create that uh, wonderful Dublin core uh, description, but there's also then the ability to create really nice exhibits and really nice web pages that pull together your resources. Uh, Emeka is really built on the principles of collections management and with that goal of creating at least a similar organizational structure in terms of a physical exhibit. You share collaboratively, uh, a can share a collaboratively built pool of items, media, and their metadata. So that really depends upon how your site's set up and who will be doing the work. But it is kind of nice that you can share those resources across uh, sites if you would choose to. You can create relationships or relationships are created between your resources. And we're going to talk more about items, item sets, and media as we go. But you kind of have those, those areas. And then, of course, you share resources, you can share resources between sites and users as well. Kind of out of the box, there are the three metadata schemas that are vocabularies that um, Sharon mentioned. We're really going to be talking more about Dublin Core here because, of course, we're here. <laughs> so we're going to focus on that. And we're going to actually look and talk more about value suggest in just a few minutes, because that's a really interesting one, especially for those of us who worked with libraries or archives. You can build templates for your content. And you can also draw from all possible vocabularies. You can create a custom vocabulary if you need to create additional vocabularies. And then one of the, I think, um, neatest things you can do is you can also share your uh, templates for your content with colleagues or really even out on the open web if you should want to do that too. Each project, as I talked about earlier and Sharon touched on this too, that each project can have its own site with its own design. So you have that one installation and then you can have you know, multiple sites within that installation. Each of those sites can be completely different in terms of design. You know, really the only thing that's going to be um, connecting them is if you share materials, if you share uh, items across those sites, you may even share users across those sites. If you have users who are going to be, or staff who are gonna be working on multiple sites, you might may even share um, people across those sites, but, the design and all the theming and all that other stuff, what modules you're going to choose, what extended functionality you may have for each site can be completely different. Emeka has a public interface and what I call a staff side or work side interface. And you know, having been a metadata person for a while, that's a kind of a common way that these types of software are set up where you have sort of what the public sees when they go to your website, and you know, they, they see the, the images and the text you've created and, and your description, your uh, metadata description, but they're not seeing all the fields and things like that. And that's all on the staff side. And we're gonna look at all of this in just a second. Within the individual sites, so we have the installation as a whole, and then we have the sites within that installation. Uh, within those individual sites, they're made up of pages. And pages can be lots of different things. They can look very exhibit-like. They can have maps in them, depending upon you know, what, what you need to do with your particular pages and your particular sites. They can have multiple levels and they can be built or used as part of the navigation. 
So you may be kind of getting a sense of like, wow, there's a lot to think about in terms of just what a Nemeca site could look like or how you might approach a Nemeca site. So you know what your resources are. You have your resources already, perhaps. Maybe you're just starting to digitize things or maybe you have um, an institutional repository or digital archive of Fedora or a DSpace. Or maybe you have digital files and you're just now starting to think about like, where would they go? So, you know, planning really is the key in terms of uh, thinking about what you would do with the Mecca. And this also is helpful too in determining which Mecca that you might want to use or which might be better for you. So, you know, some things to think about when you're planning is really what would your site look like as a whole? And there's lots of different ways to do this. You can do it very designer oriented and, you know, some designers do wireframes and layouts and all that kind of stuff. Or you may just even write an outline, like here's the things we would want to be able to do. So things like, you know, what kind of site would you build? What kind of resources are going to go into it? But hopefully you know what resources you have already. <laughs> so what kind of resources are going to go into it? Uh, who's your primary audience? What are the goals of your site? How are you going to welcome and orient people? You know, what are you, what is the landing page going to look like? How are you going to help people understand what your site's going to be about? What would you want to highlight on your site? And that's a very important part of it because as you start thinking about what your pages would be, and then of course those pages are going to be what's displayed to the public. Those are going to be what makes up the bulk of your um, Emeka site. Those pages would be the, some of those resources that you want to highlight. So what, what would you want to highlight and how would you want to highlight it? How are you going to group things together? And you know, how are you going to grab people who work on the project? Do you need to think about rights and permission? Uh, do you need to include that in your metadata? So there's lots of things to think about. There's the site plan as a whole. You know, what do you want your site to do? And we have some great site planning tips on our website, and that's in the resources. So if you've not done a site plan before, or you've not worked through a site plan before, then I would suggest to definitely take a look at our site planning documentation because it's excellent. And then the other piece of it, and I would assume being at a Dublin Core conference, <laughs> that you would want to, uh, you know, use Dublin Core and you're going to want to consider what your best practices will be for that. So, you know, that's the other piece of it too, is you may, as you're thinking about what your workflow is going to be and what your metadata is going to look like, make decisions based upon, do we need to create a custom vocabulary? Are there things that we would need to add to the Dublin Core elements? Or um, do we need to write some best practices for those Dublin Core elements? I worked on a project where I had student workers who were helping me input uh, some of the metadata and I quickly discovered that, um, you know, I needed to uh, use value suggests so that they would see Library of Congress subject headings and could just choose off a list. And even then that wasn't always, <laughs> wasn't always great, but at least they had a starting point. But I also needed to write some best practices in terms of how do you, how do you reconstruct or write a title? How do you create a title for a photograph? Things like that, because, you know, they didn't know. And it was something that, although I had done some training for them, I really needed to create some best practices a really cheat sheet kind of things like you know here's what a title should look like follow this template for a photograph follow this template for a manuscript and that was very helpful and and helped them to create better metadata it also of course then helped the uh, metadata that was in my amaca to be more consistent and of course then that makes searching better for for our users and you know it's a cas really a cascading effect. So some approaches to working with items and I've already talked touched on this just a little bit but you can share a pool of resources across sites 
or you can limit to specific sites. So there's so much you can do with Emeka in terms of exactly what you want the workflows to be. So, you know, that's one of the things to kind of think about as you're doing your site plan is also what staff may be doing this work and then what roles or permissions you would need to have for them. And we do have that information on the website as well in terms of our users laying out those out. And we'll look at them in just a second, but laying out those user roles. And then also, um, you know, kind of thinking about what that workflow would look like. So you can share a pool of resources across sites and you may just have people who are just working with those resources that exist. You may have users who are adding new items individually. So they upload or link to something that already exists, maybe a, your YouTube videos, they're gonna just link to it and then they're going to do that metadata description work for it. You can, as Sharon mentioned, you can use some of those crosswalk tools like uh, the DSpace connector, the Fedora connector. That's one thing you can do, or you can use a variety of import uh, functionalities. And we're gonna talk through the CSV import just a little bit because that is a little bit of a complex, um, it's a little bit of a complex process. So I'm not gonna go through it step by step, but I am going to just kind of show you briefly how it works. Of course, you can do any or all of these. It really is going to depend upon what you have and also whether or not you already have some metadata. So if you have been working, maybe creating some metadata in a uh, spreadsheet using Excel or maybe using Google Sheets, you can get that CSV file from either of those and then you can import that right into Emeka using the CSV import um, module. Now, <laughs> there's, there's a little bit more that has to happen to that, but it's definitely doable. So let's talk about infrastructure as we sort of dive in. And I'm going to kind of talk through things, and then I'm going to demo things, and then you'll have the opportunity to play. And I will share links also so that you can continue to do some exploration on your own time as you have time you know, over the next few weeks or next month, you can come back and do a little bit more exploration and testing too. So items are really the basic building blocks of an Emeka site. And this is, this is your resource. You have an item and that is something that you have media for it. So you have a file and then you have some information about it. Now that information of course is going to be the metadata. So, you know, that's the pieces, sort of the two pieces of it. You have a file or you have a YouTube video and then you have some information about it. And as I said, the information can be in a spreadsheet. It can be, you know, all the different places we get. <laughs> we get information, right? It can be anywhere. You can use URL, so you can, if you have YouTube or you have a URL, so let's say you wanted to, add something from your website or add something from another resource, you could always use the URLs too. And you can upload directly to Emeka as well. So, you know, just as an example, and this is a sort of an example that might be something that some of you have even you know, worked on. I want to create an exhibit about historical architecture. And so I have uh, architectural plans of a single building. So I have you know, some, some architectural plans, and I've scanned and digitized those architectural plans. So I have my PDFs. And I'm going to upload those to Emeka, and then I'm going to provide that contextual information, that metadata that we create. So, you know, things like the title, who created it, rights, copyright, general description, all that. We're going to use Dublin Core. Emeka has Dublin Core baked in, but you know, we could use it, as Sharon mentioned, just out of the box. We really don't need, if we're just using Dublin Core, we don't really need to go and add other vocabularies. Now, we may want to add some other vocabularies. So, for example, if we want our um, uh, staff to be able to look up and to look up 
against the Library of Congress name authorities, we could add that in a resource type, a resource template, and they could do that then. And I'm going to show you how that works in just a second, but that's very useful, I think. So we have our items. We have items. We can put items with items have a media attached to them. We have item sets, which we can use to organize things. And then we have, once we get things going, we have kind of our public interface. The public view is going to depend very much on the theme. So when you start looking at a Mecca site, you'll notice they look, there's some that look similar because they may be using the same theme, but a lot of them look very, very different. So one of the things that um, can be fun or challenging, depending on how design oriented you are, is just to try several designs and see what you think. Kind of you know, once you get some items into an Emeka installation is to try a few uh, designs. Now, as Sharon mentioned, we do offer some custom design services. There are a lot, also a lot of uh, designs within and themes within Emeka. So we call the, we call our designs themes. So there are a lot of themes in Emeka. So you might try those first. I do also do training on themes. So if there is a particular theme that you're working with and you have some additional questions, you can certainly ask in the forum. And if it's one of our themes, we'll, one of us will answer you or someone in the community will answer you. Or um, you can always schedule time for uh, theming as well. Theming help is in terms of customizing that theme. Uh, if you are starting to talk about uh, customizing it beyond the sort of baked in features of that theme, then that would be the time to talk about custom theming. And that would be something that we would do uh, sort of beyond just support for it. So this is an example of a public, what I kind of think of as a record, what an item would look like. And, you know, we can just see, if you're familiar with Dublin Core, you can kind of even just see those elements there. Of course, it doesn't have all the Dublin Core aspect labeled because we've just given it sort of a more user-friendly label. And again, this display, and it's just a little snapshot, but this, this display, of course, is dependent upon what our theme is. So find inspiration. Uh, as we're talking about sort of a Mecca development as a whole and, and you know, what you should think about when you're building a Mecca site and some, some of the basics of how a Mecca works. You know, one of the best things to do is go to our directory and just really take a look at all the different things that people have done with a Mecca. A lot of the directory entries will also tell you which modules they've used. So you can actually look at those modules and you can sort of see what they've done. And that'll help give you an idea of what you might need to do to make a site that's similar. But there's so many different designs and so many different ways that people use Mecca that um, one of the best things to do is just go in and really look and see if you find something you like. So those are three sites right there that are all very different looking. They're all Mecca S sites. But the behind the scenes all looks the same. So front side, that public side, that the pretty side can have just about any design or theme you can imagine. You can even, as Sharon mentioned, you can even build your own, have your own theme that you're built. If you have someone who's a designer in-house or has that uh, skill set in-house, you could, you could take one of the existing themes and do whatever you want with it. <laughs> That's the beauty of open source, right? You can do whatever you want with it. So you have that ability, but then the back end side of it, or what I think of as sort of the staff side or the administrative side of it, is really going to look the same for everybody. Now, this is an item, and this is not the whole item, but as you can see here, uh, there's our Dublin Core elements. And we if you look over here on the right side, you'll see that we there's these three uh, default uh, proper list of properties that we have. So we have Dublin Core, we have the uh, bibliographic ontology, and then we have the friend of a friend or folk. 
So we have those three baked in. So you may not need anything else beyond these. Or you may want to, like I said, if you want to be able to, uh, to pull or check from the Library of Congress name authority file or the subject heading authority file, or you want to be able to pull from Getty and have that pop up so that people can actually see those headings, those topics then you will want to use um, you will want to use the value suggest because that's exactly what the value suggest does is it suggests one of those values and that's something you actually choose so you would actually choose for subjects you know i want to use library of congress subject headings or i want to use getty or i want to use both so you can give your users your staff members a chance to choose whichever now, um, we'll talk more about value suggest and just look at it in a second, but I did want to just show you the um, basic staff side interface in terms of editing an item so that you would see those Dublin, Dublin core terms represented and you know, just sort of be able to see what we um, do. You also notice that we have the ability to add the URIs there as a link. So that um, technology is, is really baked into a Maca.s. And we're going to talk more about resource templates in just a minute. In this particular example, I don't really have a resource a template assigned to this one, but we're going to talk about those in just one second. So um, I've already talked a little bit about the metadata support. I wanted to kind of zoom in a little bit so you could see this a little bit better because I know looking at um, kind of a little snapshot can be a little bit challenging. Uh, you can also choose other things here too. So you can um, you know, use friend of a friend or you could add your own custom here and choose something else. Or uh, like I said, you can use the value suggest to define what they're going to be seeing as a lookup functionality. And we're going to look at that in just a second. Uh, the other thing is you can in customizing this, you can choose which Dublin Core elements appear. So if you want to add additional, um, if you wanted to add additional uh, properties, you could do that. And when you actually uh, go over here on the right side where you would add those properties in, it will actually give you a little bit of information about um, what that Dublin Core because we're looking at Dublin Core in this case, but what that Dublin Core property actually is. And that's just pulling uh, from Dublin Core. The resource templates. Resource templates are really, not only are they very useful, but it's also a way to help impose some quality control over your uh, work or the work that others may do. And it's also a way to, to um, really be able to define a particular template for a particular kind of work. So you may do a template by you know, person or for example, television series. You could have a, a template for really for just about any kind of work that you may collect. So for example, one of my projects was working with 3D digital objects and so I had a template just for those because they're sort of a really weird, well, not really weird, but <laughs> they're kind of a new emerging format and I needed to really put some parameters around it uh, so that we were really explaining and, and doing description that helped people understand exactly what that was and how it was to be used as opposed to, you know, this is a, a, a digital file of, like a 3D movie kind of thing rather versus a 3D digital object that people can manipulate. So, you know, resource templates are really useful and there is a base resource template that is created for every uh, Mecca site. And that's something that's a default template that's set up. This base resource has no owner assigned to it. So you may notice when we are looking here, uh, there, there's the label, which is what, we would create when we we're creating our resource template. There's the class which we would choose when we were creating our resource template, or we may just leave it and not have any. And then there's who created it or who's the owner of it. 
The other thing you can do is you notice you, there's add new resource template at the top, but there's also import resource template and you can also export these as well. So that's a way that you can share these resource templates you know, back and forth. You can even share them in projects. Um, you know, there's a lot of potential in terms of being able to share this because this is essentially a metadata template that you can then assign for an item that will um, facilitate better, uh, better quality metadata as a whole. So base resource that's baked into a Mecca that comes with the Mecca, it is a default. It maps to the metadata fields required by DPLA. So you could take this base resource if you needed to prepare something that was in a Mecca to a package up and send to DPLA, you could just use that, the base resource, apply that to those items that you need to. Of course, you still need to do your metadata work, right? You still have to do the description. <laughs> you, you, it's, not a, it's not a shortcut to the description. You still, your metadata description, you still have to do the work, but it would apply those elements that DPLA would expect to see to those particular resources. Again, you will see no owner for this because this is something that is um, a default. The other thing you'll notice here as we're looking at our uh, resource templates is that there's the ability to say whether or not a, an element or field is required. So you can say whether or not it's required and then you can show, say whether or not it's going to uh, be a private field. So I know sometimes when I've worked on projects, I needed to communicate something else to another a person working in my Emeka installation. And so I actually created a separate field for that so that I could put those notes in there just for someone else. And that would be something that I would not want to display to the public. It might be something more about how we're going to process or handle something, or even something maybe a little bit more about the metadata description, but something that I would not, in my case, it was about the processing and handling of particular materials because of how the rights were assigned for those materials. And so, um, you know, just ensuring that that would show up for just those particular materials. So when you create your resource templates, one of the things you can also decide is if you do have some field that for some reason you need it to show up when someone's logged in, so another staff person could see it, but the public wouldn't see it, then you can do that. Uh, you can also choose whether or not something's required, which means, of course, someone has to fill it out. They can't skip that field. It has to be filled out. Now, you may think like, I'll just make everything required. That'll be great. I'll have great metadata. Well, for one thing, that doesn't really necessarily make great metadata. It just makes metadata <laughs> because it means they have to fill it out. But the other part of it is too, you just will need to think about, of course, as you do with your metadata description, does that Dublin Core element that you're making required in this particular resource template, will it apply to everything that you're going to assign this resource template to? So, you know, will you always have a date associated with these particular um, items that you're going to associate this resource template to? If you're not going to have a date, then how are you going to handle that particular date if you're going to require it? Or maybe you're not going to require it. Uh, if you have manuscripts or um, textual works, you know, they, they may or may not have an alternative title. So that one would probably be one you would consider about whether or not you would not require that. Uh, if you were preparing things to go to DPLA, and you are wanting to take this resource template and um, you know, really make those fields required that DPLA is going to require, then you know, that might be one of the places where I would kind of look at it very carefully, take their list of what they have for the requirements and then just go through it and make sure that what is here that says required actually matches what they say is required because that would ensure once you apply this template and you have items that are added using this template that would ensure that at least those fields were addressed. 
it would not ensure the quality of that data, but it would ensure that that data was filled out. So value suggests, um, this is really one of my favorites. Uh, this does give extended support for so many things. Um, Sharon talked about some of these, but geonames, the Getty vocabularies, Homosaurus, the LC Link Data Service, the OCLC Metadata Service, which includes the Vinter, uh, Virtual Internet Authority file, RDA vocabularies, view catalogers, that's there, rights.org. So you could do a resource template or as part of your resource template, you could um, value suggest from rights.org and that might help in terms of just pulling in, helping your uh, staff just pull in a rights.org without having to type it in or copy and paste it in or go look in rights.org. And they still have to understand what rights they were applying, but at least they would just have that, you know, kind of connected right there and many others. So what it does is it will bring those vocabularies in and as you're typing, it will kind of pop you up with a little list. So it adds that autocomplete feature to a specific property in a resource template. Of course, users always have the option of creating their own value instead, and this in no way will ensure, necessarily ensure that there'll be good quality data. Um, you know, with subject headings, do people really understand the scope and how a particular subject heading is defined in that controlled vocabulary? Maybe, maybe not. It really depends upon how much experience they've had with that particular controlled vocabulary. And it does use resource templates. So here's an example. And this is adding, we're going to add a resource template for graphic novels. And when you are working, say, with subject, which is probably one of the most common to use in terms of using value suggest, when you're adding, um, you first add, if you need to add something to your resource template, you would add subject. And then once you do that, then you would edit it. And at that point, you'll then see under your data type, you'll see the list of all the different things you can choose from. And you can see here, there's a lot of different things. So if you are a you're working with metadata or you want to uh, crosswalk metadata maybe between your ILS and a Mecca or back and forth, then you know resource templates can be something that can be really helpful as well because you can address both the subject headings and you can add. So you can, of course, with Dublin Core, you can have multiple elements. So you could have a subject that is the Library of Congress subject headings, and then you could have a subject that is the Library of Congress um, genre form terms. So you could add both of those. You can also edit your label. So you can have an alternate label here. So for example, this is subject, and I could change this and make it say like subject, and I could put in parens, you know, LCSH or subject, and then I could put, you know, LGFT or the genre terms. So, you know, I can actually, I can kind of customize it a little bit so that people can see things. I can also give a little bit of information if I want to tell them a little bit more about that. So this would be something that would be set up not necessarily right at the beginning, but I would say the sooner you set up your resource templates, probably the better because it will help in terms of the workflow. Uh, there's where under other options you see the required so you just check if you want to require something. Uh, once you get it set up and you have your resource template you'll see it'll appear under the select a template when you're editing an item or when you're uploading an item the same sort of thing you'll be able to see it there. Uh, you choose your resource template and then when you choose your resource template and you go to the particular area that you have designated with that controlled vocabulary. Whenever you start typing, in this case, I just started typing statue, and it's going to start bringing up all of the Library of Congress subject headings that have the word statue in them. So pros of doing this, it can be very helpful in terms of um, helping guide people to especially the right subject heading or the right name heading or rights.org or 
you can probably think of other situations where it would be wonderful uh, if you're using uh, geo names for places. You know, there's lots of different ways that this can be helpful. Of course, if you have a particular subject heading and they're not finding a match or um, the information, they, they've chosen a subject heading that doesn't match anything in the Library of Congress subject heading, then that's what you've used as library, you know, that's what you've used for that particular uh, subject in terms of that vocabulary, then of course that's going to be something that'll have to be addressed because it's not going, you know, it's not going to be able to find anything. So they're going to have to add something and you may have to help them. So you'll definitely want to think about especially in this group, <laughs> think about what your metadata best practices would be. And part of that will be or can be your resource templates and value suggests. So I, those two things to me just kind of go hand in hand where value suggests can really help, especially if you have multiple people who are going to be adding items and adding metadata description. If you are gonna have multiple people who are adding metadata and metadata description, adding those items, then having those best practices in writing, even like a little cheat sheet like I created, it's gonna be really helpful. And then being able to check against controlled vocabularies is going to be helpful as well. Uh, certainly if it's just you and you're the only person working on this project, this is a real time saver too. Now statue and statue of liberty, there's so many things there, statue of freedom. There's so many different things there. That one isn't particularly a, a good example. It's a good example of the things you may, the long list you may have to wade through, but it's still much quicker and easier sometimes than having to dig around in the Library of Congress subject headings. If you know that that subject heading exists, but you're not exactly, say, for example, you know the Statue of Liberty is a subject heading in a Library of Congress, and you know it is in the name authority file, but you're not really exactly sure of the form of that particular name, then using value suggest can be a really great tool because it's, a, it's an easy way to kind of see at a glance, like, oh, that's what the form is. And then you just choose it and you know that you're using that correct form. And you know that it's also using that linked data because it's going out and going through the, the linked data process. So, Let's back up and talk about modules briefly. Hopefully that one sounded really exciting and, and like something that would be a real time saver because I know I've done both metadata work and traditional cataloging work and um, you know data entry, like what can you do to make data entry go a little bit faster or to make it a little bit smoother or to provide some quality control around it. And both resource templates and value suggest are wonderful tools for being able to do that. Of course, the other, um, uh, module that Sharon mentioned was the custom vocabulary, and that does give you the ability to be able to add, even add more. So if you don't find something in value suggestion, the list is much longer than, than either Sharon and I, or I, I talked about. So if you don't find what you're looking for, your vocabulary in value suggest already, then um, you know, certainly that you could probably add it through just the custom vocabulary too. Or you may create your own vocabulary if you're working on a particular project where you have a need that's not addressed sort of in any known vocabulary out there. Um, there's a vocabulary for beer. So there's a vocabulary for just about everything in the world, it seems. But if you, if you have a special vocabulary need, certainly you can add that through the custom vocabulary. So custom vocabulary, and value suggest and CSV, which we're gonna talk about next, are all modules. And what is a module really? Well, you have your Emeka installation and then modules are little pieces of software that extend the functionality of what Emeka can do. Now, there are so many more modules than we're talking about today and I've linked in the resources the modules page, so you can spend as much time looking at modules as you want to. Things that we have created and that we support, say, and make a Mecca team on them, and that's true for the themes as well. So we'll say a Mecca team. Um, but you know, certainly you are 
welcome to take a look at this. Is, we're an open source community. You are welcome to take a look at any theme or any module that uh, that is of interest to you, regardless who created it. Uh, certainly, you know, it's up to you to kind of test things and figure out the work for you and all that kind of stuff. But that stuff's there for you to try. So modules, themes really deal with the design. Modules extend the functionality. So they are installed separately. A lot of the themes are installed separately too. There are some themes that are built in, but they, a lot of the themes are installed separately. And then once you get them installed, then they are activated. Now, installing modules is usually not very challenging. Uh, it does get installed on the server along with Emeka. So there's a folder in the Emeka installation on the server where the modules live. There's also a theme folder on the server. And that I know, you know, especially um, with some organizations, that whole server access stuff can get very complicated. So um, the process in theory is not very complicated to install uh, modules or if you're using Emeka Classic plugins, but getting to the server and installing them and all that kind of stuff. You know, if you have IT staff, you would definitely uh, probably talk to IT staff before you do anything <laughs> with Emeka because you want to know sort of uh, do we have the system requirements and what I might need to do or, or ask them to do because it may be that you're putting in a ticket. So always check with your IT staff. Uh, you may also be the IT staff. And if that's if that's the answer and you are the IT staff, then you probably know whether or not you can do this. <laughs> so some modules work behind the scenes and that can be things like alt text where we are adding the um, alternative text so that our images are accessible or PDF embed so that the PDFs are actually embedded on the pages so that people aren't having to download the PDF, they can just see it right there on the web page. Um, those work behind the scene, work, kind of work behind the scenes to extend functionality. Others will give you things you can do that will impact the sort of the public interface, uh, things like building maps through geolocating your content. And then other modules really help with workflows. And we've talked, we're really talking more about workflow modules in this particular session, just because uh, so much of the metadata work is about sort of workflows and best practices and what really will help in terms of building that good and consistent metadata and being able to leverage it as we continue to move forward in a more semantic web oriented view of metadata. So there are the important importers you can use to bring content in from a spreadsheet, such as CSV import, which we're gonna look at next. Um, or you can connect uh, your installation to Fedora DSpace. And we're just, we'll just touch on that a little bit. We're not gonna go into all the details of that. Um, but that one, it, those two are kind of nice because it will, it does have the ability to update content periodically. So you don't have to manually do something if you have those. You just connect it up and it will periodically update that content in your Emeka. If you currently have an Emeka Classic site and you want to, or maybe you have an Emeka.net, which is a classic site, uh, but you want to move to an Emeka S and have it hosted on your own server, there are importer tools that you can use to um, you know, get get those um, get those sites into a Mecca S. So Sharon mentioned these. I just pulled this from her list. Uh, we've already talked about values suggest. We've already talked about custom vocabularies. Um, we talked. She talked a little bit more about numeric data types. So this would be something where you would really be looking at what ISO, ISO standards you would need to apply for dates and numbers. And this is probably not going to apply to everyone, but certainly if you work, are working on some projects that may be of interest. Uh, import, we've already talked about, um, I know Sharon's already talked about Zotero and the Mac S importer. I'm gonna talk you through the CSV importer just at a high level. And um, then we'll continue to kind of talk about the Fedora and DSpace a little bit. 
Uh, Sharon also mentioned some of the ones that are coming soon. The data cleaning is very exciting. And I think for those of you who are harvesting or ingesting metadata from other resources, uh, we do support that kind of movement too through API. So harvesting, ingesting, or if you are maybe doing import through CSV and you need a lot more cleanup, um, you know, there is a lot of a lot of potential opportunities for there as well. Data visualization, uh, Sharon talked about that we're getting ready to, to roll out the first version of that, but then we'll be extending past the bar graphs, uh, bar charts and graphs and things like that. So that's really exciting to uh, think about um, in terms of what Mecca data that's in a more visual format, like what it could really look like and stuff. So I'm, I'm gonna be excited to see what people do with that. And then of course the persistent identifiers, which is a, I think is gonna be really exciting too to see what people um, people do with that too. I do know that Archive Space is a fairly large community and Archive Space is really focused on building finding aids for archival material. And so the data is in a little bit different uh, format, but um, I think it's gonna be really interesting uh, to see those finding aids being able to be brought into a Mecca and um, what people can do with it. So if you have an archive space where you're building your finding aids and then you have an Emeka where you're putting your digital resources or maybe you have a D space and you're putting your uh, resources there and then you have archive space, you could bring both of those in the future. You could bring both of those into a Mecca S and then you could build a really wonderful page where you include both your finding names from archive space and your actual resources that you've digitized in detail. So I think it's gonna be really cool. And it's sort of the same thing with collections based in Dataverse, but I think it's gonna be really cool to see how, um, how we can combine things with that. So I'm gonna be interested to see how that goes too. So that's, a, that's some of the, sort of some of the modules that as Sharon talked about, and I just wanted to kind of give you a list of those. So let's talk a little bit more about kind of the inside of a Mecca and how a Mecca works. So we looked at items already a little bit from the metadata lens, and we talked about resource templates, which you can apply to those items, and that will uh, impact what fields you see, what elements you see, and then also if you use value suggest, that would be a way to, you know, suggest from one of those vocabularies for subjects or names or rights or whatever, whichever, whichever fields you choose to use that for. But how do you get items into a Mecca? Well, I mentioned CSV import. That's one way of doing it, and we're going to talk about that in just a second. But I want to talk a little tiny bit about items themselves and then talk a little bit about item sets. So Emeka has items and those items have the media attached with them or you attach the media to them. It can also be something that lives on the web already. So you can either upload things to Emeka or you can use existing things. Now existing things as a URL, I mean, you're your choices are kind of unlimited there. It can be something from your website. It could be something from a repository that is not DSpace or Fedora that we don't have a connector for yet. Uh, it can be all kinds of things. It can be Flickr, it could be whatever. So you have a lot of choices by having that URL and being that your media source. Uh, YouTube is nice because it will capture some of that YouTube information as whatever it can. So that item is really sort of the basic block in terms of the metadata, as we could see. So that's really the description about your file or your medium. So an item is both the media or file part of it, and then it's that information or metadata that you want to display in your digital collection or you want people to see. So if they are searching for your items, you want them to be able to see that information about those particular items. So items do not have to be in an item set. 
So especially if you batch add items, you may just, you know, up, you may just batch add a whole bunch of them and they may or may not be in an item set. You can move things to item sets later, uh, but items can only be in one set. So it's an organizational unit around those particular items. Of course, a set can have multiple items. So if you think about a bookstore and how we organize books and group books together, a book can only be in one place at the same time, right? But of course, like a row of books can have a, can have a whole bunch of books. Personally, in terms of doing this kind of work, I like to, I'm a little bit of a planner. You can probably tell that from my site plan idea. I'm a little bit of a planner, but I like to create or think about at least some of my item sets first. So if I have my resources, and you may already have an idea of what your item sets would be. If you have a collection that you've digitized, is that collection, will that collection be your item set? Maybe. So if I have the Emeka S archives and I have the Emeka S manuscript papers, I'll just use that as an example, then you know maybe papers would be my set or maybe I would organize it by papers and date if we had collected all of the writing since the, and various notes that people had taken from the beginning of Emeka development. So, you know, if you have resources that you have already created, or maybe you have created finding aids for those resources, you know, can even look at those finding aids if you're going to put those resources into a Mecca or you're going to use those resources in a Mecca in some way, maybe connecting it with your connectors or importing it, then that might even be what your sets would be. So I think for some of us, and I'm probably one of those people who can get really, um, really, really in the weeds when it comes to sets. <laughs> and, I, and I start thinking about like how everything's going to be organized. And, but if you have items, you probably already have some sort of organization to them. And it may be that they're in boxes and you're digitizing them that way. It may be that they're organized by date. It may be that they're organized by what kind of format they are, and it may be that they are organized by who donated those works or who those works belong to. So you may already have some sense of what that organizational structure would be in terms of organizing your content. So, you know, I would say look at what, take a look at the resources you would want to include in Emeka and then think about where those resources currently live and how those resources could be grouped together. And as I said, I would go ahead and create my item sets as once I got Emeka installed and I sort of have something in place, then one of my, in my resource templates, I've made some decisions about that. I've made some decisions about you know, what fields are going to be required, all that kind of stuff, all that metadata stuff, then I would probably do my sets next. Because that way I would sort of have the foundation of my workflow in place so that when I start adding items, I start batch, item, batch adding items through CSV import or uh, one of the connectors, I sort of have those foundational pieces in place. I already know what set things are going to go into. I kind of have an idea, I've already made decisions about my metadata, you know, so I have a sense of that. Now, that's not to say that this won't grow, and hopefully it will grow as you go along, because, um, you know, you will want to continue, hopefully, will want to continue to add to your Mecca installation. But at least with those initial resources that you're going to put into a Mecca, those initial items and media, if you've made some decision, about how they're going to be grouped, that will be helpful. In terms of adding items though, and we're gonna look at adding item sets and adding items. In terms of adding items, it's very easy to do. You just go to the items. You'll see a little button at the top that says add new item. And you see everywhere you see a pencil, that means you can edit something. So anytime you see a pencil, that means you can edit something. Anytime you see a trash can, that means you can delete something. Now delete is delete. So if you delete, other than a few places, if you delete things, you're really deleting it. <laughs> so um, 
delete with caution, as with all of all of these things. So add a new item, we get sort of a, I'm using my resource template I created called LC. It's very, you see, there's not much there. There's only three, three uh, properties that I have chosen. So title, description, subject, there's really not much to this particular resource template, but this resource template actually will go out and check and suggest Library of Congress subject headings. Now I could make a much uh, longer template and you know, I could put, put much more in there and customize it a little bit more, but just for the purposes of making something short, it's just three elements, not very much. So my values are my metadata. My media is where I'm going to upload or add those files. And then item sets is where I would assign that particular um, item to go into its organizational grouping. Sites is where I would assign it to a site. So, you know, we're talking about having multiple sites and you can share resources across sites. I could do that with my resources as I'm creating them. Now that also depends upon what my user level is. So I may be a user who is not able to add things to a site. I may just be um, working within an existing site. So um, that's basically how you add, very, very simple. We looked at the uh, values and then we looked at them adding the media just a few minutes ago. So let's look at how we would do this using batch Patchwork and CSV import. So CSV import is a module. And when you look at the module screen, you'll see that there's actually a little list of all the modules or, or some of the modules will appear here. It depends upon whether or not they have additional functionalities. Uh, there's our resource template. So when you log in, depending upon what you have permission to do, you will see more or less over here. Um, if you can do resource templates, you'll see resource templates. There's our link to our vocabulary. There's our items and item sets. So it really depends upon what you can do. In terms of CSV, if I have the ability to work with the modules and use the CSV import, I would see it over there. And then I'm just going to um, open that and it will immediately prompt me for my import setting. My import setting being my CSV. You can use TSV or ODS. Um, I have primarily used CSV for this. That seems to work a little bit better for me. I would say, depending upon what you're working with, if you're working with Google Sheets or Excel, you probably don't need to change anything here. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't change anything in this first part to begin with. I'm, I'm not gonna go through every single setting here because this gets really uh, complex, but in terms of this auto map, you can actually um, have it try to completely match up. So if your spreadsheet already has Dublin Core terms, for example, it's using title, then it will try to match that up to DC term title. The same thing with description, same thing with creator. So you can have it try to do some work for you to help match up or map those particular um, fields. You can map these. This is using that auto map simple. You can map them, you can edit them, you can change them. And this is something that you may need, depending on what your spreadsheet looks like, this is something you may need to you know, take a look at. But there is the ability to take a spreadsheet that has, it does have to have a, uh, a row with column headers for some kind of, you know, column heading of some kind, like something that's the title or something like that. So it's got to have that in order for it to work with Maca and to be imported in. But as long as it has that, it will take those columns, which is here on the left. And then if it can, if you use an auto map, it'll try to map those things to those Dublin Core elements. If not, you're gonna to have to do, if it doesn't find a match, it's just gonna leave it blank and you'll have to make some decisions. You can also discard stuff here too. So if you decide you don't want to bring over something, let's say you've let people or people have just assigned um, topics, but they're not topics that are a subject heading, maybe they've assigned like the project ID or something like that then you may choose to discard that particular, um, 
that particular column and not bring it over at all. So there's lots you can do here. And like I said, I'm not gonna go through everything because there's a lot that you can do. Uh, you can, under each mapping, you can specify the properties, you can specify um, you know, whether or not, um, really, you can get really specific in terms of what you're doing and including where your media is coming from. So where that file is coming from. So this you can do so much here using the wrench icon for data options related to the column in your CSV. So there is so much you can do here. So takeaways here, if you can get your metadata into a spreadsheet, this is a great way to do really big batch um, bulk imports of metadata. Uh, advanced settings, you can also append, revise, update, and replace all. Now this is dependent upon whether or not it can match up files. So you can do so much. If you have batch edited a lot already in a Mecca, this may or may not work for you. The other thing that's really cool about CSV import is you can also undo stuff. So if you import something in and you realize, oh, I forgot to put it in a set and I was gonna go ahead and put all of those thousand items into a set so they would be in their set and I wouldn't have to do that work, then you can actually undo that import and then at the point of import, you can set them to go into a set and re-import it and it will, it will put it there then. It will also tell you what you've done and whether or not it's successful. And you can actually get a little uh, sort of snapshot of exactly what it did to you. Uh, you can, you will sometimes get various little messages and the job details will, that was that little snippet we looked at, it will tell you exactly what happened and if something went wrong. So for example, problems were detected with the import. And you just need to look through the log and then take a look at the job details and it'll give you a little bit of information. So it, it will try to help you when it can. A lot of times it's gonna be formatting uh, kind of issues. Once you've imported files, then you can go in and look at them. If you put them all in an item set at the time of import, then you can easily go look at them uh, that way and just see them all in that particular item set. And so in this case, um, I don't have really good titles <laughs> because this was something that came from, from another resource. But you know, in that case, once the items are in a set, you see the batch actions there. So I can do some additional batch processing here. Or of course, I can go in and individually edit things as well. So um, you know, I can, like I said, do that batch process, or I can go in and I can edit each of these. Uh, there's a lot of things that you can do in the batch edit items, and this is one of the things that has just been such a wonderful, I mean, for me when I was working on big metadata chunks and big item chunks, this was really helpful. Uh, being able to batch edit and set the template in terms of that resource template, or being able to go in and take things out of item sets, or being able to actually, uh, something was wrong. So for example, there was a typo in the spatial coverage name. So I'm able to take that out by removing it and then I can add it back with the correct name so that it, it shows up correctly. So you can do a lot and, and you can also do the same sort of thing too where you can add your eyes as well. Um, now remember this would apply to everything that you've checked to batch edit, edit in that batch. Uh, you can select things to batch edit too, which is really helpful. So I can't spend too much time on batch editing. Unfortunately, it's a really cool thing, but that can be very helpful for this kind of work too. So groups of sets, we've talked about items already being grouped together and being collected together, being the organizational tool. Um, it's very easy to add those. And then the pages, which we're not gonna spend a lot of time talking about, pages are really the way that you're gonna curate and display the items. Uh, pages can also be used just like a web page on your website. So, you know, you might do an about page. A Mecca always gives you a um, welcome page as the default. And pages, you know, it's, it's 
sort of similar in terms of presentation where you can do things like, um, oh, I'm sorry, we're looking at item sets. Uh, you know, with item sets, it's the same sort of thing where you can do some basics edits. Anytime you see the pencil, you can edit. If you see the delete, uh, you can delete. But just knowing that it's going to be uh, permanent delete. So add a new item set, same sort of thing. You click on add a new item set, it will take you through that. The item set will have its own Dublin Core metadata associated with it. Just remember that that metadata will apply to everything that is located within that set, or it should. So as you're describing those resources, just think about all the things you've put in there. Um, sites made up of pages, pages made up of blocks. And we're gonna look at this a little bit. The two things that are um, important to know is that blocks are the way that you can really display all your content, the item, media, text, and more, and they're movable. So you can move them up and down on the page. And we're gonna take a look at these in just a second. Pages, or pages display, this is where I thought I was. <laughs> uh, you can view them. So that little, um, like a screen with the arrow is the view. And then your edit is the pencil icon. Trash can, of course, is the um, delete. So you can also move these around and you see this dash here that has moved those in the hierarchy. So you can move things around and sort of nest things and organize things too in terms of the navigation. And this is kind of what pages look like. So they're they're up here at the top. Oh, my little thing got off. They're up here at the top. So monuments and memorial. And this is a drop down because there are those nested pages here. Just like daily life on and around the mall, it's nested pages. So there are other pages down here. How it looks, the colors, et cetera, how this uh, menu looks is all controlled by the theme. Uh, what appears here is controlled by what we put in the navigation. Um, all of Mecca S sites start out with a welcome page. There's not really going to be anything on that welcome page, but it's your landing page. You can delete it, or you might just want to edit and change it and just make that your welcome page. And we're just going to go through pages really briefly because I want to give you a few minutes to actually um, play and test with some Mecca stuff. So to create a new page, you put in a title. You do put in, have to put in a URL slug, and this is going to be the piece of it that would be appended to your website address. So it might be like amecca.org slash about. Uh, you can use dashes. So if you wanted to say about us, it would be about dash us. You can't have spaces. And then you can choose whether or not you want to add it to that navigation we were just looking at. So, you know, we're talking about creating a new page and how you have nothing when you first create it. Well, <laughs> if you create a new page, you have a page, but no content. It's really just a placeholder. So we have decided, made a decision about whether or not we want it to be on the menu. We've given it a title. We've given it that URL. And that's really all that we have. Uh, the blocks that we have over here on the right is also dependent upon what uh, modules that we have. So depending on whether or not we have particular modules, we may see more or less over here. Uh, HTML is how you can add links, write text, all of that kind of stuff. You can also use HTML um, to embed certain kinds of third-party content. So that, that sometimes works with some of the third-party content. Um, you can use item with metadata. And of course, this includes the item with its metadata. Media embed is a way to embed media types. Item showcase is a way to select items to add to a carousel. And then maps, of course, you do need to have geolocation, but you can also use pinning to maps. So if you don't have that metadata in your items, you can also just pin things to maps. So I know this is a little bit hard to see, but you can go in, I've given you the link here, you can go in and look at this page. So all of this is sort of chunks of blocks that have been uh, created using just using these little ad block areas. So 
when you, this is actually looking at that same page and, and editing it so we can see what it looks like. As you can see here, we have the page title. So there's our title up there at the top. We have a URL slug, our page title. That first block is a map. And then we have all the images attached to that down below it. And then we have a chunk of HTML, so just some text. And you know, kind of keeps going to build things together. So this is pulling from the items that you have in Emeka, as well as additional content that you are adding to it. So it can be additional content that you're writing. It could be additional content that you're embedding from somewhere else. Um, it can, I mean, there's a really a lot of different things you can do with this. So who does the work? You do. And I'm not gonna read through all of these, but you know, you will have a global admin who will have full installation privileges, the ability to set up other users, the ability to do everything, that person. Uh, supervisors have full permission to create, edit, delete, item, item sets, media, all that kind of stuff. And um, you know, your global admin is really going to be the person who will do kind of the, the setup and installation of things. You can also have editors that help do things and help work with things as well. So one of the things you'll want to do is really take a look at the user roles and then to figure out exactly if you need people to be able to do different level of work, then exactly what their roles will be. Uh, these are all on the Emeka website and that information is linked at the end of it. I want to just talk very, very briefly because we've kind of touched on themes off and on, but we really haven't talked too much of themes. So we're not going to talk too much more about themes. I've given you a couple of little examples here of themes that we create. You see the little Emeka with our icon. That means that is an Emeka theme that we've created. It is the way that you can change colors, layout, and sometimes aspects such as graphics. So if you want to include your logo, some of the themes do that and some of the themes do not. There are lots of themes there in the themes directory besides what we support. So now we have a few minutes for you to do your thing. So um, think a little bit about, I'm gonna give you about uh, 10 minutes maybe. We have just a few minutes here, maybe about five minutes actually since we're wrapping up. Uh, you can log in here and you can use one of these as the password and one of these as login. You can also do this later if you want to spend a little bit more time. And um, really, you can do whatever you want here. So if you would like to go there and you would like to uh, just take a look around, you can. If you want to go there and uh, if you have something on your desktop and you want to add it, you can. If you want to edit an item you can, but I will give you a few minutes to try that. And while we're doing that, I will go ahead and take any questions that anyone may have as well. So that's thank true. you very much. Thank and, you. Uh, that's, that was this tutorial. And I hope I see you around at other presentations. Have a good day. Take Thank care. you. You too.